Yo, what is up? You have found We Like the Blazers. I am Brandon Goldner. They call me King Rosacea. And over there through the screen in the United States, it is Rain with Luge. Rain, what's up, man? How are you doing, Brandon Godner? I'm good, and there's definitely no reason why we're pronouncing each other's names like this. Uh, I am King Rosacea. Man, I had a flare-up. I'm, I'm going to have to give you the wife's skincare routine. She's She has massively battled that throughout the years, and she just found a, a, a regiment that's not insanely expensive that has made a massive improvement with her so we'll off 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 air i'll have to i'll have to send you over her uh, her regime i'm legit not kidding do send it to me it's funny if you had caught me yesterday i had grown a sergeant pepper mustache to distract people's eyes away from my rosacea flare-up but it's it's gotten a little bit better and so i was like off with the sergeant pepper mustache i um, still need to figure out something to do to distract people away from this random effing bald spot i still have in my chin i trimmed my my beard like three weeks ago because it got kind of burly right and apparently like it had just grown over the spot and i'm like what the f is that oh boy and it's like oh, now boy. all that i see so like if i know nobody else is seeing this on camera but if you see me like doing this a lot yeah, <laughs> it's it's <laughs> i, I, I know the... it's there and i'm trying to get it back to the growth and i'm just like doing comb over stuff to try to cover yeah. it and st- <laughs> Well, that that is fair. But aside from our skin and beard routines, we have got a special <laughs> guest. Portland Trailblazers reporter Casey Holdall is joining us. Uh, you have obviously heard of his work on The Briefcase, which is his solo kind of uh, quick recap pod. And then also, of course, his work on The Blazers Balcony with with uh, Brooke Olsendam, along with all the writing that he does for the team. Uh, before we get into that interview, Ryan, anything else? Uh, preseason's over. Blazers uh, failed to beat a uh, an NBA preseason team. Uh, they only the only win coming against the New Zealand Breakers. Uh, how much of the preseason did you watch there, Brandon? I would say I watched a good fifteen to twenty percent of it, which is not very much, to be completely honest with you. Um, had uh, I watched stuff. a good fifteen to twenty minutes of it total. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot going on, um, and I've seen clips. You know, I've seen the highlights. Uh, I would say my takeaway from the preseason is that there's no takeaway. It's tough when your future franchise player is half my age. Man is 19 years old, Ryan. I know. It's I try not to do that mental math. It makes me depressed. It's not it's not great. Um, obviously, uh, Tamani Kamara is the next MVP of the league, which is exciting. So that was kind of fun to see that. You always want to when the, I mean, the Bla- when the Blazers are bad, you want to have that one or two player that you are irrationally high on. And and for better or worse, Kamara is probably now that guy. Um, so I, I yeah. just don't know. Like, I, I mean, I'm interested to see what it looks like during the regular season. I'm interested to see what Chauncey Billups can do. Can he actually get some cohesion with a team that is now, you know, should be the type of people that he works really well with and developed a ton last year. So did Shaden Sharp. So maybe he'll perform better as coach. So I just, I don't really have an opinion from it. So, some of the most hilarious reactions that I've seen has actually been about Phillips. You know, I I've seen people like, Hey, he was brought in as a defensive minded specialist. Like he has this new group to mold, but like the defense seems to be worse. And I'm just like wanting to rip my non-existent hair out of like, it's 19, 20 and 22 and 24 year olds. Like what the F do you expect? Like you don't mold clay immediately and just be like, all right, I'm done. My no, no more work here. I, I can take my hands off of this. Like it's, it's, it's a bit of a process, but for me, the one thing that I have noticed so far that is probably going to be the biggest driver of how much of my time I end up giving to watching this team is the fouls. Like I love the idea of that. This is a young athletic team that wants to play fast. Fantastic. You can see that they want to, but my God, it's hard when a whistle is blowing every 15 seconds. I think Cassie had had a tweet uh, the other day during the final preseason game. And it was all as it was his first quarter lasted 36 minutes. I, I, I have to ask, insane. tell me that you just said that on purpose though. Tell me that you said that on purpose. No, I, I don't know. At this point in time, his name's Bob. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> Y'all will find out why I mentioned that in just a second here. Um, yeah, I mean, playing right, playing fast is cool in theory. Maybe they have the players to do it. I, I, my, I'm skeptical um, if you don't have the requisite skill to amplify and take advantage of playing fast. 
then I'm not sure how much good it does you. Like, do you have the shooters? Do you have the vertical threats? Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. Some of it's injury dependent. Some of it's motivation dependent. And so I, I just, I don't know if like, yes, it would be cool. Cause I'd look the times when the blazers were most successful in their franchise history, Ryan, what was one common thread between the 1977 team and the early nineties teams? Uh, uh, they played fast. Fast I was breaks. just going to say there was a people pinwheel who, on the logo. I was going to go people who were willing it. to run people who could throw head ahead passes, Bill Walton, the best passing center in the history of the league for a very long time. Um, so like, yeah, it's kind of cool that like maybe the, uh, I don't know, like the spirit of the Blazers best teams could manifest now in Scoot Henderson. We're pinning all our hopes on you. This Scoot. Bill Walton, you say, as Ryan holds up an autographed basketball, it says Bill Walton Hall of Fame, as if we would forget. But yes, that Bill Walton, it would be great to see them play fast. I don't know. And again, like the the, the league continues to change. And so, yeah, I, I think that that's fair. Any other thoughts before we kick it over to our interview with Casey? Not that I can think of. Let's see what uh, this lovely man has to say with uh, absolutely no mistakes made at all during the recording of this interview. Absolutely none. Here we go into our interview with Portland Trailblazers reporter Casey Holball. So we're joined here by Cassie Holdall. I'm guessing from his car outside stop, the practice. Stop, facility. stop, stop, stop. Right. You don't it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Did I say uh, hey, it? You, you, you said Cassie and it's, it's Casey, uh, but you know, it's, it's yeah, all right. All right, like, fine. Uh, we have editing. Per, we have editing. I, I called editing. Malcolm Brogdon Rob Williams today. So like, <laughs> okay. you know, it, ha- it happens. This is all staying in then. Okay, good. Go okay. Ahead. All right. So moving on, we're just going to pretend like that never happened. So I, it looks like you're joining us outside the uh, parking lot of the practice facility. If I have to take a guess. You are correct. Okay, you you are right. correct. Yes. I, this time of year, uh, you know, between practices and preparation for the season like every uh every minute counts and so yes i'm doing this from from my car because i didn't even have time to get back to a place where i i would have felt better about the wi-fi so i apologize for that but uh but yeah you're you're seeing how the how the preseason sausage gets made here in the content world <laughs> wait a second i'm i'm in new zealand why are the leaves on the trees still green isn't it the late October at this point? I mean, what? I yeah, don't know. It's it's 80 today, bitch. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it, it's not good. No, exactly. That's I mean, good, while it, no. it, it's nice to have a little uh, reprieve, um, yeah, it probably should be turning by now. I will say that it's two <laughs> nice days now after it being torrential downpours for like the past week before that. But uh, I, I gotcha. agree with you, Brandon. I, it, it always gets a little concerning for me where I'm like, why? Why is it still comfortable at the yeah. end of October? Like it, it should be miserable by then, by now. That just means two feet of snow this December, if I if I'm remembering correctly. It, it, no, it's it's El Nino this year, so it's going to be warm and incredibly wet. Is what they're <laughs> already predicting. So we might not get snow, but uh, flooding seems like a real possibility. Oh joy! So I'm curious, especially from your angle, what it was like for you um because for one you're you're pretty vocal and you interact a lot on on social media but what it was like for you for somebody in your position to have gone through the off season that the trailblazers just went through and like all of the events surrounding the dame drama and whatnot and was it hard to just kind of sit back and hold your thumbs back from the uh from the good old tweet or z buttons or whatever the heck we're calling them these days actually the exact opposite Um, it was almost freeing a little bit because it was something that I knew that it wasn't really my place to probably talk about it a whole lot. And, you know, all the stuff, particularly stuff coming out of Miami, I know I, I would make a few references to it here and there, but you know, like I'm not out trying to, (laughs) to, to throw stones at other, other guys doing the job. I mean, generally you do the job to your best of your ability and I, I respect that, but you know, this situation was like, since it was something that there was already a lot of talk about how much you're supposed to talk about dames camp being like, you know, getting kind of their hand slapped by the league at that point, it's like, we all got to kind of do what we're supposed to do here. And what we're supposed to do in these kind of situations is to really let the process play out. And so for me, it never felt like I was like, Oh, I got it. I got to put my opinion in this but one because like, I just didn't feel like particularly for someone in my position, that's the right thing to do. But two, you know, the Dame stuff has just been going on for so long. I mean, even not, I mean, this summer it obviously reached ahead, but mm-hmm. three, four summers before that, every single summer was like, well, what's going to happen. He's going to leave. Will he, won't he? And so for me, it's like, 
anything that I already had to say about that, I have already, I had already gotten out of my system. And, you know, when you, when you know, these people personally, like it, you know, that's the part for me where it gets a little frustrating because, you know, you see things that reported that you're like, I, I know that's not true. Like, but other than that, it's like the whole like process of how was it going to play out? Like it, I didn't mind not kind of being a part of that because I think particularly the way it played out, you, you kind of realized as I realized a long time ago that this is all speculation and table setting from different organizations got nothing to do with the actual truth or what is actually going to end up happening. And those are the things that I'm interested in, like all of the kind of the scuttlebutt rumor mongering around that, that's stuff that I've, I stopped caring about that stuff a long time ago and that's all it was this summer. So from that perspective, it was actually really easy for me to not do anything. Like I, I was fine to let that play out. I'm actually curious and I'll, I'll give it back to Ryan after this, but like you've been in your role for a very long time, damn what 15 years. How long has it been? I mean, this is my 17th season with the team and I I've done 17. a few different things here and there, but for the most part, I mean, digital content has right. been the name of the game for the entirety of it. Yeah. Totally. And like for any reporter, there's like a certain amount of, um, you know, political awareness and kind of mindfulness in your role um, that you need. But I think it's particularly true of someone like you, who's also a representative of the team. And I'm just curious in the time you've been doing this, what is something that you've learned about yourself or in what ways have you found that you've grown as a person because of the role that you've been in for, you know, 17 years? Yeah, I, I think, um, for me, more than anything, you know, when I was, and maybe this is just every, this happens to everyone when you get older, but like, you know, I was always, I've always been very, uh, forward with my opinions about things. Um, I tend to believe that I'm usually right about things. And I think for the most part, I generally am. But uh, what I've learned in this job throughout the years, um, is that, you know, you really need to be open to the idea that like, you actually don't know as much as you think you do. And mm -hmm a lot of times too. And it's not even like about being right or wrong necessarily, or about like what the truth is or what it isn't. It's just that a lot of times like things change. And so what you thought was real or what might, might've even been real one week might not necessarily, might not necessarily be what's real the next week. And when you're too kind of entrenched in those opinions and thoughts and the Intel that you've collected, I have just found throughout my career that, that a lot of times like you need to be a lot more flexible than that. And people might not be lying to you. And generally they're not lying to you. They just might not know the answers either. In sports, a lot of people want to act like they know what they're talking about or that they're kind of in the game. So, you know, there's always that piece as well. They have to be a little cognizant of, but for me, it was really understanding. And I, and when I learned this, and this is something that I've actually thought about a lot that I haven't really mentioned, um, that kept coming up during the Dame thing was when Kevin Pritchard was the general manager and the end of his tenure. And I don't know if you guys remember, there was a reporter at a Yahoo uh, who was really like, this guy's in trouble. Something's going to happen here. There, there's going to be a parting of ways, who was a, a younger Adrian Wojnarowski. And everyone in market, myself included, was like, what's this guy talking about? Like, <laughs> everything's great. Kevin is, is dialed in. He like, I don't know where this is coming from. We were all wrong. And <laughs> he was right. And it was one of those situations where it was like, our conventional wisdom of what that situation was, was completely wrong. And so I learned a, a valuable lesson way back then that was like, Hey man, like you might be with the team. People might tell you stuff. Like you might feel like you have a good handle on all these things and you should trust yourself generally, but you also really need to understand that you might have things wrong sometimes and it's not going to benefit you. And it's not going to benefit your readership or, or the people that listen to you for you to be so again, just dead set about what you think, you know, because sometimes those things change and you need to at least be willing to change with those things and to not have such an ego that like, I know what the answer is, you know, because the, sometimes there's not an answer. Sometimes if there is an answer, it changes. And again, those are just things that like, whenever I see guys covering the league who are so just like, this is the way it is. I'm just like, man, <laughs> wait 10 minutes, man, because like you, it, things change and you're going to find that out eventually. Um, so why go so hard on like, I'm right about this thing because you, you might be wrong about it. And it sounds yeah, like it, you need to be imaginative 
about the many different ways in which stuff can happen or could be, I mean, how does that impact your work as you're trying to deliver something to fans that kind of like, you need to be open and imaginative about why stuff is happening. How does that actually show up in your work? I mean, for me, it shows up by like trying to take different angles into things too. And really not really trying to, you know, like explore a little bit more, particularly with players, like who they are outside of the court. I know everyone kind of talks about that, but I, I don't feel like anyone kind of goes as far into it as I do. So like the thing that I remember is like writing that candle story during the playoffs in Denver, you know, like (laughs) just like you, for me, part of it is about being open to just like all different kinds of content forms. But another part of it is is being able to switch gears a little bit and understanding that like, sometimes you think you might know things, you might be wrong about those things. Focus on something that you can be right about, you know, (laughs) like, Mm -hmm. and sometimes those things are the non-basketball parts of it. So I don't even know if I'm exactly answering the question you're posing to me right now, Brandon, but that's one of the things that I kind of have always thought about is that like, if it's always just about the basketball, like it's one, it's going to be burned out. And two, like you just don't, everyone's life in an organization is about more than that. And they're people. Well, right. Exactly. And, (laughs) and so, and and like it, it, there's just this idea that it's, it's the most important. It has to be the most important thing. And I think for a lot of guys it is, but I, I also think it's really important to remember that, that they're humans and it's like, it is a game and you know, the, and it's entertainment too. And you know, the point of the game isn't always like, to figure out who the best team is. The point is to entertain your fans while also generally find out who the best team is. And you know, that, that can go in a lot of different directions, a lot of different ways. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. So, you know, that's, I, I, and I've always felt lucky in my role too, that like I've been given the latitude to kind of figure out different ways to approach things. So uh, I've, I've been lucky in that regard, whereas maybe some other people who work for teams, especially might not have had those same options. Yeah. To, and, you know, cause providing that, that human lens to, to just the sport. So you're not staring at just names on a names on a Jersey and whatnot and going, Oh, well, that guy's only worth like 12 points. Be like, well, yeah, Hey, but here, here's this family and here's everything that he's done for them. And what this, what this job has allowed him to do for, you know, help his brother open a business or do all this other stuff. So like just given that like human element. And so a little bit of an awkward pivot now. Brandon's previous question would have been a great pivot, but that, <laughs> no. Sorry, man. Um, <laughs> you know, for, for some unknown reason, we've noticed that the media landscape in general since about 2015, 2016 has massively changed. Uh, no one will ever know why, but uh, um, I noticed it, especially now more in sports journalism and sports reporting, where it's almost like everyone is trying to take news that they see and try to figure out the angle that, somebody's working, you know, it's, Hey, this is a mouthpiece for so-and-so or, or this person isn't as plugged in or this person, you know what they, uh, um, they're just in it for an agenda. Heck the agenda thing. I see a lot with, you know, Danny and, and all his stuff that he's been doing. Everyone's like, Oh, well, you're just trying to get a cushy job with the team. But I'm, I'm curious your take on how you've with having been in this industry for as long as you have, how you've seen it change so far. And do, do you think that it's changing in a good way, a bad way? and kind of where you maybe see it going from here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my preface to that would be that like good work is good work, you know, and, mm-hmm. and people that are doing a good job now are doing really the same things that people who were doing a good job 30 years were doing. And so like that part of the job, I feel like has, hasn't changed. Uh, I, I, I have seen a change and, <laughs> and this is might sound especially weird coming from someone who works for a team and, you know, kind of in a lot of ways, I don't know if we've ushered this in and I, I hope it isn't, this isn't necessarily our fault, but it does seem to me over the last five, six years, especially that, you know, the, the real focus on like, I'm writing this story, not as a favor to the player and the agent, but just the idea that like, the relationship is the part that matters to the person writing the story, not the story itself. Mm -hmm. And, and really kind of leaning all the way into more like, I'm just going to tell this story from the player's perspective without 
trying to get any broader perspective about what the actual scenario might be. So like the, the notion of access journalism and, you know, someone who traffics in access journalism, my, you know, mm -hmm. my, my access is predicated on the idea that I'm not going to do things that are going to, you know, look especially bad for the team. We can be honest, but you know, we, we shouldn't really kind of get over our skis about some things. It feels like that's really been adopted by some other journalists in, in some other markets where it's like that notion of objectivity. And I realize that there's debates about that in journalism broadly about can you be objective? Should you even try to be objective? Mm -hmm. But it, it does seem to me that there's a lot of one-sided quote unquote reporting now that is only kind of player focused because that's who you need to have the relations with as a players for the most part. Like, and yeah, there are guys who traffic with general managers, but for the most part, it's like the players what matter in the NBA more so than I think than any other league. And so I'm just going to make sure that like this player is cool with me and whatever that takes to do, what do I need to do to, to ensure that regardless of what that means for the actual work I'm turning out, I don't care. Like if, if the player likes what it is, then I think it's good work. Like I, and that even as someone who works for a team, I don't think that is a good place for the industry to go. Like I, I think everyone is better off when there is kind of more standard journalistic practices when it comes to sports content. And my, I will say too, that like it is sports. And so like, I do understand the idea that like, it's pretty low stakes. So like, is it really that big of a deal if, you know, a, a rosier interpretation of situations is kind of given a, as the truth? No, it's not that big of a deal. But again, I, I think the other option is better. And I think that in the long run, fans, players, coaches, organizations, executives, I think they're all better served when we have a media landscape that is a bit skeptical about things. Like I, that is, that's the way that this thing works the best. Well, journalism was always meant, I mean, the, the joke was always that's the fourth branch of government because it was always the thing that provided the check on, you know, everything. Right. So exactly. And, you know, along those lines, too, I'm curious to get your take because you have the absolute uniquest perspective on this. You know, and nowadays you're seeing a little bit more of a rise of a lot more independent journalism. I'm not, and I'm not talking about in regards of, you know, people that are going to Substack, but people that, you know, Goldner and I don't have delusions of grandeur about anything, but you're seeing a lot more people that hey man, speak are, yourself. Starting, <laughs> are starting <laughs> things and actually gaining traction and starting to report things themselves. What's your take on, like the kind of growth of the, you know, the little guy journalism per se. I mean, I think that, I think that is great. The only thing I see from it is that it does seem like a lot of it is, I, I feel like I'm seeing a lot now that like people will kind of develop a little bit of a falling on social and then like, they'll get some DMS from a player and then it'll be like, Oh, now I know this guy. And like, <laughs> so like for your, I, I think, if you're really interested in doing it right, and there are guys that are doing it right, I think that's a great way to go. If you're more interested in just like people knowing who you are and feeling like you have a little bit of access and the way that that makes you feel outside of like actually really doing a job other than passing along the rumors you're here on Twitter, that I do not think is a very, very good place for the industry <laughs> to go. And I don't necessarily think it's going that direction. And there's some people that, that have kind of made that jump that, that do it well. But mm -hmm. I think that's a very small minority. And I, I think that it's much more likely to go bad than it is to, to work out well. I, having said that, though, with the state of financing in journalism, like anyone that can go out and do work that's even halfway decent and make a living, particularly if they're doing it for themselves, more power to you. Like, And, and I, I don't think it's that big of a deal as long as people just approach it with a decent amount of media literacy, which is that, you know, as long as you at least consider where something is coming from and the way that that might change how that information is portrayed to you, then great. Like I'm not, it, it still has value. It's mm -hmm. just, you need to kind of have a, a base understanding of like, well, in the most cynical parts, what, what would be the reason for this getting passed along? And I think as long as you're again, as long as you understand that and don't take anything you read or you hear as gospel and more like, well, this is a piece of a puzzle that can inform my understanding of a situation, then I think everyone has a role to play in that, particularly people who are, are kind of self-employed or, you know, like 
are friends with a family member of a player, which I think, you know, we, we've kind of seen more and more throughout the mm-hmm. years, particularly as kind of the, the industry traditionally kind of falters, people kind of rise up to, to kind of fill that gap. And again, those people I think are without the, the checks and balances in place, which I would also say too, like, the notion that that newspapers 50 years ago had strict journalistic standards that they never, you know, went against. That's also BS too. Like, you know, the, the industry has always had its problems, but now there's just so few checks that I, I think as long as you go into it, understanding that, I, I think that brand of journalism is, it's just fine. And again, I think it's important. I just think it's, it, people should understand where it comes from. The reason I say that is because I'll see some things now that people kind of put out there on the street where I'm like, Hey, if my team came to me and said like, Hey, we put this out there. I'd be like, guys, no, like, the, <laughs> like it, it, there has to be at least a whiff of legitimacy. And I, and if we're just like trying to like set a, set a table for something we're trying to do and it's a complete fabrication or it's something that I know is not true. It's like, I, again, that might be a short-term benefit for somebody it's not a benefit for our fans and, and I don't think organizationally it would be a benefit either. So like, I, Oh, I guess what I'm saying is I see some stuff every now and then now where I'm like, I wouldn't even do that. And I work for the <laughs> team. Like, so I don't know where, where the line is for some of you guys, but you passed it a long time ago. <laughs> um, I will get you out of here on this one. Cause uh, cutting close to your, your uh, heart out here. Uh, I'm curious how, what your recommendation would be for fans on how they should, you know, kind of watch this team this year. I've, I've seen, you know, Vegas has their over under season win total, I think 28 and a half. Um, and there's a lot of debate on either this team is going to, you know, take a year or two or three, it's the youngest team in the league. And then there is uh, some just wildly blind optimism of, I could see this team being a, a seventh seed. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to save fans some sanity and some undue angst. I want your professional opinion as somebody who has seen this on what is a realistic expectation and how should fans try to approach this upcoming season? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we, the players and the coach have talked about this a lot. Cause I've been kind of asking for kind of what I'm going to write before the season. Like what, what would be a successful season for this team? You know, like what, what for you, if this happened, it would constitute success. And, you know, everyone's like, Hey, we want to win games. Like we, this idea, particularly guys like, like Ant, guys like Jeremy guys who have been here before, even, you know, a, a guy like Malcolm to a lesser extent, you know, their first part of that answer is always like, Hey, like we feel like we're a pretty good team. We feel like we're going to play hard. We're not going out there assuming that we're just going to be a bad team. We're not out there playing for draft picks. And that's something that you guys know well too, that like players don't care about getting draft picks. Like they want to win. And they don't no want player, their replacement coming in. Exactly. The idea that like, oh, I, I, I'm going to be happy to, to, to lose, to play bad basketball, to make myself look worse in order to bring in someone who's also going to supplant me like that. Players don't view it that way ever. I've never come across a single one that views it that way. So, I mean, there's always that piece, but I, there is an honesty about like where the team is at right now and what they want to do going forward. And so for me, I I think the important thing as a fan of this team is like, I just want to see this team make progress and growth. And I want to see them play hard on a night to night basis. And I think those are pretty good benchmarks to start the season with. Like I don't, from a win loss perspective, I wouldn't even bother, you know, like I, I don't think that that, really matters all that much this year. I I think the way they play matters. I think the growth of scoot, the growth of Shaden kind of and taking that next step, seeing what they have in Deandre Ayton, seeing what they have in Rob Williams. I I think those are really the parts where you focus on that and consider what those players do. That really defines more what success is about this team than are they going to be in the race for the play in, you know, with a, with a month left to go in the season. And, you know, I, you know, and, and Chauncey talks about it as well. He's like, look, like I don't view rebuilding as meaning losing. I don't view developing as losing. I think he literally said that at practice today, <laughs> but he also understands the situation this team is in. He's been around the league a while, both as a player as a coach. So he understands that kind of the way things go. And I, I think, you know, if, if you're a fan who the only way to gauge success is by wins and losses, 
I think this year might be a tough one for you. And, uh, and, you know, I I would say like, I would just say like, try to derive something else from it, you know, like, and and if that's really all that matters to you like that, that's cool. Like there's nothing wrong with being a very like results oriented fan. And I think particularly after the last couple of seasons, the way that it's, it's ended, like, again, I don't fault anyone for being like, Hey, I want to see this team actually start to win. You know, like I, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with feeling that way. I think you just might be setting yourself up a little bit for aggravation this time around when you might want to kind of view more of the ancillary parts of the game. And again, figuring out like, because that was a, a complaint that people had about the Blazers, you know, is that it's like, they're fairly consistent. They were going to make the playoffs every year, but no one really felt all that good about their chances of really doing anything in the postseason. And, and at that point it was like, well, Hey, what's the point? What's the point of being the eight seed? If you're going to get bounced in five games, like what, what does that really do for us? How does that get us to our long-term goal of being a championship team? And 54% of the time, right? No, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and so I think having been in that situation too, I do think Blazer fans are maybe a little better equipped to kind of go in this direction now than they were before. Because I think anyone, again, who's kind of watched the team for the last five, six years is like, yeah, you know, we, we know that Dame's going to be great. We know that, you know, they're, they're going to make a run at some point in time and they're probably going to be a little bit better than people think, but we're not going to be a team that we feel strongly about having a chance to really advance in the postseason. And now you have a team where it's going to be harder to even get to the postseason in these next couple of years. But I don't know that if at by time they get to the point of this process, call it a rebuild, a reboot, whatever you want to call it, kind of a a redirection, a pivot. When they get to that in three years, I think people are going to feel much better about the chances this team has of being a contender in the postseason than they did any time in the last five or six years, maybe outside of the the season they went to the Western Conference Finals. So I, I think, you know, preaching patience is tough, particularly when the past two seasons have gone the way they've gone. But I I do think that if you're a fan who's interested in seeing this team actually reach some higher heights other than just maybe winning 50 games, then I think that's the, the, the prism with which to look through this season. How how are they getting towards that goal of being a team that at some point in time could really legitimately compete for a championship. And I, I think you see that more out of growth this season than, you know, being the eighth or ninth seed. Well, Cassie, I thank you for your time for uh, allowing a little Ryan. bit. Of pe- I got it. I got it. Uh, no, he did. That was a, that was on purpose, right? Like that's well, that's that's a good I'm situation. Staring of the joke. At, I'm staring at, in all honesty, one of my cousins' middle or one of my cousins is named Casey, so it's also written spells the exact same way. So it's and he's not going to come that. back on the show at this point. So so no 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 no. I I, I do want to <laughs> tell you guys. So you know, I I try to know the people who work in the arena, like. Uh, they're my people, like the, the security guards, the people that, that work in concessions, like those are, those are my people. Like that's where I come from. And so I really try to make a point to like, know these people. And there's a security guard who, who works outside the family room. So, you know, players, their family, they come, they put the kids in like a little locker area so they can hang out and have food or whatever. And so there, and there's a regular guy who, who is out front of that door and I, and I know him fairly well. And, uh, I saw him at media day. And I was like, oh, Sean, how's it going, man? He's like, oh, it's going great. You know, things are well. You know, we kind of shoot the S for a minute. I get home that night. I'm like, wait a minute. That, Sean isn't his name. His name is Casey. <laughs> and literally, I, and I knew it was something Irish. And like, I, I would, but it screwed me up because since my name is Casey, I was like, that's yeah. too easy in that moment. So I was it like, it must be, be something because, else. Yeah. And so then the next day I go and I was like, I think I called you Sean the other day he's like you did and i was like casey i'm really sorry that because so like legitimately someone i know who has the same name as me i still managed to get wrong so ryan you can call me cassie all you want man like it's it's no thing (laughs) well i again i thank you for your time uh you know like like i was saying a a peek behind a little bit of like the journalism i i I always like getting those perspectives of the people that are in the fields when we talk to them just kind of like give a peek behind the curtain of their area of expertise and also i very much thank you for me trying to or for joining the bandwagon of talking goldner off his optimistic ledge of that this could be a play-in team i'm I'm trying 
trying to keep trying it to stop I'm, you. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> prepare yourself. As the guy who has to deal with his emotional fallout when they maybe don't reach that, I'm just trying to keep him in check. So I very much thank you for your time. We'll try to chat again at some point in time uh, later on down the season. And thank you very much. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you now again you to have- Casey... Oh, no, I was still no, going back. On. Now you have me. Is it Casey or Cassie? Now I'm doubting myself. Where? What side did I fuck it up on? <laughs> it's Casey. It's Casey. That's what I said at first, is- and then y'all called me out no. on it. No, 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 no. You said Cassie. You said Cassie twice with him. Then you said Cassie again here. It's very funny. I'm laughing. It's okay. Um... We are back. Uh, let's leave all that in there. I don't know. We'll see. I'm how fine with it. Fuck it. Whatever. But listen, and like, like you said, I mean, he <laughs> literally called somebody the wrong name, even though that person's name was Casey, and his name is Casey. So we all make mistakes. It's, it's really not a big deal, and he's cool. I, I always appreciate talking with Casey. He is honestly like one of my favorites, uh, and somebody who. Frankly, I kind of look up to because I didn't get enough time to ask him even more about it. But that emotional maturity part, how do you navigate such a highly political job working for a team and representing a team and you're surviving multiple administrations, so to speak, of different leadership and people have different proclivities and where they want to focus their media. And he's been there for 17 years. I just I don't know, like he's an impressive person. I appreciate his time. Um, The Blazers play their first regular season game. On Wednesday, 25th of October, that is going to be away against the Los Angeles Clippers. One question for you, Ryan, will the Clippers be fielding one Mr. Jimothy Harden when the Blazers play the Clippers on that Um, fateful Wednesday? Obviously not. The Sixers just hired Harden's old high school, you know, uh, favorite, favorite man, uh, the the free agent, Neil Olshay as a consultant. I, so he's the going same nowhere. Day, the same day that Terry Stotts unexpectedly resigns as, as assistant head coach of the Milwaukee bucks, which is very strange. Like I'd love to hear more about that, but that is really weird, man. Like, I don't know. What do you, uh, I, if I'm Joel Embiid, I'm going, I'm like, what is going on? I don't think that like Neil O'Shea coming into your organization, whether he's a consultant or whatever, I don't think that's a good sign. Like, yeah, between the O'Shea news and then the actual picture of the Sixers releasing their, their city edition jerseys, the city of brotherly love, the, MB, the MB, Philadelphia I, brotherlies, <laughs> so, the it's NBA so needs to rein this uh, in. I know it's a cash grab that they do every year where they want to get these city edition jerseys jerseys out their limited run force fans to go and spend another hundred and whatever some odd dollars on you know this latest edition but if these things are just going down the toilet farther and They're farther so and farther like just at this point are in they time, doing it on pick, purpose i don't know i can't imagine so because nike doesn't have many misses with their stuff and so to just i don't know it's it's uh, they just got to stop it and like everyone is worse than the next like i'm actually impressed on how many of these are just really bad i'm i'm scared they just need to pick what the blazers are gonna look like like what they need to do now, if because they were all limited releases, fine. If you want money, keep them as limited releases. New players will come in, yada, yada, yada. They need to put it to like a, every team gets a fan vote. Put it up on their, on their team website and be like, pick your top five or like top three of our city edition jerseys. And then grand total, take the top five out of that and just do a yearly rotation. So, hey, this year we're going to go back to the Oregon City ones. But now guess what? You can get a scoot Oregon one. You know, you can get a scoot, uh, the the throwback, uh, like the Mellow Years jerseys ones. You can get them in the new players. You can still get that money coming in. But you don't have to rethink the wheel every freaking year because you're just running the wheel into the ground right now. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And so, okay. So the Blazers open against Los Angeles Clippers in LA. We'll see what happens. I agree with what you said during the interview. Um, actually you and Casey both saying like, look, you have to watch this season differently uh, and maybe not look for just wins and losses. And so it's going to take some time. We will be back telling you all about that on the next episode, whenever that is at some point in the not too distant future. If you want to get a hold of us, you can always do that on Twitter. Yes. Twitter at Goldner PDX or the witty Ryan or at like the Blazers. You can also also find us at we like the blazers.com or we like the blazers at gmail.com. That's a lot of different things. So until next time, thank you so much to Casey Holdall. Thank you, Ryan. I'm Brandon. I appreciate you all. And until then, go Blazers. Go Blazers. <laughs> <laughs>